that you multiply them for the benefit of your kingdom. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, we're in part three of this series, XO, Love Relationships in the Church. In week one, we really broke down what the love of Jesus is for us. And we, and we studied the fact that when Jesus enters into ministry, there's a new word that has come into existence called agape love. And it's love without reciprocation. It's love that is freely given. It's not based upon attraction. It's not based upon what we can get out of it. It's not based upon what you can give me to get it. And we looked at the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead and the note that Mary and Martha sent to Jesus. Their brother's on his deathbed. And they're sending a note to Jesus saying, hey, I need you to save my brother. And all the note simply says is the one you love. The one you love. It's an absurd note. It's not what I would have written, I can promise you that. They had a faith, they had an understanding as they walked hand in hand with Jesus that all they had to say to Jesus was, hey, the one that you love needs healing. And Jesus would come and heal. And last week we talked about being present. How God's love is present. And it's our job to then be present present in that love, that, that his love doesn't hold our past against us, and he also doesn't hold our future against us. Man, we should all praise Jesus for that, amen? He loves us right where we are, right in the middle, right here, right now. His love is present. It's unbelievable how he operates. This week, we're going to continue talking about relationships, and it's, it's probably going to be a smidge more practical, if you will, but we're going to pick up in Genesis chapter 25 at verse 24. We're going to read the story, just part of it, of Jacob and Esau. I hate reading and preaching about Jacob in the Bible because it's eerie whenever I read about Jacob. Some of you know Jacob really wrestled with God. He wrestled with God literally to the point that God displaced his hip. Jacob was also not much of an outdoorsman, as we're about to read. He, he, he liked to be inside a little bit. And I read all of these things about Jacob, and I think, I don't know if my parents set me up for failure or what. Did they not read the story of Jacob before they named me Jacob? I mean, come on now. John the Baptist or something. Get, you know, I mean, come on. But we're picking this up. It says, when the time came for her, her being Jacob and Esau's mother, to give birth... There were twin boys in her womb. I feel sorry for her right there. I can't raise one at a time, much less twins. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. Esau came out like a Wookiee. It's true. It says it right there. I didn't make it up. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping at Esau's heel. So they named him Jacob. Jacob's already at odds with Esau from the time that they're in the womb. They're twins, and there's a race to see who can be first. There's a race to see who can get there. From the moment of inception, Jacob is after Esau's blessing. He wants to be the firstborn. He wants the double blessing that comes from being the firstborn child. He's chasing Esau out of the womb. It says Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. Man, if you think your life's rough, he just had twins at 60. The boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. When when. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. I look at this relationship that Jacob and Esau have, and I think it looks like a lot of the relationships in our own lives. You see, we look at that, and we're like, that's the worst negotiation in history. Esau, you're terrible. Don't send Esau to buy a car, all right? He's paying sticker price plus the dock fee. He's coming out a sucker every time. But I love it because I'm thinking about these two and their contrasting styles and the contrast in who they are. And what's true of almost every relationship that we have in life is someone is the expander and someone is the condenser. 
Someone is a little bit emotional, maybe a little bit dramatic at times. They love recklessly. They're out there. And someone in the relationship is a little bit more reserved. They pull back just a little bit. They're maybe a little unsure or a little skeptical. You will never guess which one I am in my marriage. Zero chance I'm the expander. Zero. But I think about that expanding and someone's condensing and there's this constant exchange in our relationships. There's this constant give and take. There's this constant moving back and forth. And I study these two brothers and I think Esau, you came in hungry and you sold your birthright for a bowl of stew. It's really, if you study it, a bowl of lentils, a.k.a. a bowl of beans. And when you study it geographically, it's not even good beans. These are beans that people in the Far East have lived on forever because they would grow anywhere. This isn't like he traded it for a filet. All right, he didn't get a trip to Roos Chris, right? It's a bowl of beans. This isn't even like pinto beans. This is like lima beans, And he walks in and he sells his birthright for it. He exchanges in this moment something that meant everything for something that meant very little. How often do we really do that in our own relationships, though? One of us is expanding. One of us is condensing. And we're exchanging constantly these different things. And you say, yeah, but but what, what are you talking about? What I'm talking about is I want this big question to be asked. I want you to ask yourself this all day today and all this next week. What's your bowl? What are you exchanging that is meaningless for something that is meaningful? In almost every relationship in our lives, we're exchanging something meaningless for something meaningful. And when we begin to identify what that is, we grow into deeper relationships. If we start with the most fundamental relationship in all of our lives, priority number one is that relationship with Jesus. We studied last week, and we're going to get into it some more, the ten lepers that Jesus heals, and only one gives thanks. Only one gives thanks. So what is it? Is your bowl forgiveness, grief, anger, doubt, fear, the past, the future, a lack of understanding of love? What are you giving away? that you shouldn't be giving away? What's your birthright that you're handing to someone else that you're giving away in exchange for something meaningless? I think there are a few things that we have to understand so that we don't give away what means most to us. And number one is we can't mistake growth for maturity. In our relationships, we can't mistake growth for maturity. Let me give you an example. Collier gave me a beautiful example yesterday, but y'all are going to judge me. So get all your judginess out right now. <laughs> Kristen was gone. The stories always start with that. Have you ever noticed that? There's a direct correlation between mom's gone and sermon stories occur. Kristen is gone, and I'm putting the kids to bed. She was gone because she was getting my mother-in-law some birthday presents because it's my mother-in-law's birthday. How about them apples? And so I'm putting the kids to bed, and so I need Ava to put a pull-up on because she still sleeps in a pull-up. And they're in a box that is unopened, okay? And so I give Collier the box, and I say, go put it in Ava's room, but I don't expect anyone to do anything with it but put it in Ava's room. About five minutes later, Ava walks in with a pull-up on, and Collier walks in with a steak knife. (laughs) Mama doesn't know this story yet. And I look at him, I said, son, what are you doing? And he says, well, I was tall enough to reach it. And he said, and I bead very careful. (laughs) See, he had grown tall enough to reach the knife. But it didn't mean he was mature enough to use it. It didn't mean he was mature enough to possess it. When you study this story, what you learn is that at the time that Esau exchanges his birthright For a bowl of cheap, raggedy old beans, he's 60. He had grown, but he wasn't yet mature. You know how many times I can say that in my relationships in life? I've grown. I got taller. I keep getting wider. But am I maturing? 
my relationship with Jesus. Maybe I'm growing. Maybe I'm showing up. Maybe I'm putting in some time. Maybe, maybe I'm coming every other Sunday instead of one Sunday a month. Maybe I sang one song. I'm, I'm, I'm growing, but am I maturing? Is it really changing me? Is it really settling in? Am I really using it for something meaningful? You see, we can grow on the outside, but stay very small on the inside. Every day we have to ask ourselves if we've really grown up or if we're still just governed by our childish, selfish impulses. That's what Esau's doing here. He lacks maturity in his relationship with Jacob. He lacks an understanding of what he's doing. He's a 60-year-old man. He's grown. He's a skilled hunter, the story tells us. He's good in the outside. He can provide food. He can do some things. He's grown, but he hasn't yet matured. He hasn't yet reached an actual understanding of what it is that God's trying to do in him. You see, Esau's position throughout the story is to actually be part of the lineage of Jesus. You see, he has a great calling on his life. He's promised to be the firstborn for a reason. It's not by accident. He doesn't have that blessing by mistake. It's not his to give away. Man, we mess that up. I mess that up a lot. God's given me a promise. He's given me a blessing. He's given me an opportunity. And I give it away. And then I say, yeah, yeah, but why am I not living in a relationship that I should be with you, Jesus? Because you gave away the promise that I gave you. You were growing up, but you weren't mature enough to handle the responsibility that came with it. You were growing up, but you wouldn't really do anything with it. And here's why. Unsatisfied appetites become exaggerated emotions. Our unsatisfied appetites in our relationships in our lives become exaggerated emotions. See, you should never negotiate when you're hungry. It's like rule number one, right? Don't negotiate when you're hungry. Have you ever noticed if you go buy a car in person, they want to keep you there like nine hours? They're waiting for you to get hungry. Because when you're hungry, you make bad deals because you just want something to eat. I've only got a couple of hours a day I can negotiate because I'm hungry the rest of the time. (laughs) You know, a lot of times people go to lose weight. And so they'll start eating six smaller meals a day instead of three large ones. I tried that at one point in time. And it wasn't any fun because I never got hungry. I felt like I was always eating. But here's what happened. Because I never got hungry, I never got hangry. You know, the anger that comes when you're really, really hungry? My emotions never exaggerated because I never let myself become too hungry. I never let myself become so starved, so famished. We see Esau walk in, and he smells the beans of cooking. And he's been out hunting, and I imagine he walked a lot. I imagine that he probably killed some game because he skilled, and he had to carry it back, and he had to skin it, he had to do all of these things, and he had worked up an appetite. And then we see Esau exaggerate his emotions. He says, I'm about to die. He wasn't really. That was literally him just speaking about how hungry he was. His hunger became an exaggerated emotion in his life. Man, in my relationship, here's what happens. If I'm not communicating regularly, if I'm not talking about my appetite with my wife or with my coworkers or with my friends, if I'm not experiencing those things together, my emotions become exaggerated because my emotions aren't being met. My needs aren't being met, but I'm not talking about them. And I let myself just get hungry, hungrier, hungrier, hungrier. I do the same thing with Jesus. Man, he has all this agape love and it's present and it's available to me to receive here and now, today. But I don't engage it and I don't engage it and I don't engage it and I look up and I'm an emotional wreck because I'm so hungry for his love that my emotions have become terribly exaggerated. When we get too hungry, everything else gets blown out of proportion. When we're too lonely, we're too tired. We're too hungry for affirmation or importance. Our emotions become bigger than they really are. They become exaggerated. And we're no longer engaging in good and healthy relationships because we're operating out of emotion. Remember, agape love isn't an emotion. 
Agape love isn't something that we feel simply based upon attraction or circumstance. Agape love is everlasting. It's always available. It expects nothing in return. It's not based on emotion. It's not based on attraction. You'll always be hungry when you look to anyone before you look to Jesus. You'll always be emotionally hungry when you look to anyone before you look to Jesus. No one else can give the kind of love that he can give. No one else can complete you the way he can complete you. No one else can give you peace like he can give you. No one else can give you joy like he can give you. Nobody else will take the time to walk up like we talked about last week. And just before the miracle, just take a minute to weep with you. Only Jesus can. Another thing that we've got to be careful of is we can't give up what we want most for what we want now. Now's convenient. Now feels good. Now's available. Now doesn't require a lot of work. Now doesn't require a lot of effort. Now's just around the corner. After Esau sells his birthright, he eats the bowl of beans. You know, one thing scripture doesn't say about the meal is whether or not he even enjoyed it. Doesn't even tell us if the beans were good. If they were fulfilling. Doesn't tell us if Jacob had made special beans that day that were outstanding and remarkable and the best beans that Esau had ever eaten. It doesn't tell us that because it doesn't really matter. Why? Because he exchanged what he really wanted for what he wanted now. He exchanged what was really valuable so that he could have something today. It's because the bowl always looks better in the moment than it really is. The bowl always looks better. Whatever your bowl is, it always looks better in the moment than it really is. It always looks more enticing than the long game, than the hard work that you've really got to put in. Man, we talked about this before. Jesus is in the long game business. He's not in the short game business. I wish he were, believe me, because, I mean, I would wave a magic wand a lot, and a lot of things would happen that don't happen if Jesus was in the instantaneous business, if he was in the well wishes business, if that's what he was in. But he's saying, no, 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 no. You see, it's all just one big race to heaven. I'm in the long game, which is heaven. I'm in the game of eternity, not the game of the mortal. This is just a journey that we're all on. See, the enemy wants to make a deal with us. He wants to trade our bowls for our birthrights. The enemy can't take anything from us. It's important for us to understand. He can't actually take anything from us. But what we do is we talk ourselves into giving it to the enemy because we're convinced there's no other way. Do you ever just feel alone and you're hungry, and you're unsure, and you just don't know which direction you should turn, and you'll trade the enemy anything if you think it will give you just a little bit now. If you'll just give me something for this moment, if you'll just give me a taste because I'm hungry, and I want to move on, and I want to get something different. And then once we see the bowl for what it really is, just a bowl of beans, it always loses its power over us. And then we look up and we say, man, I exchanged what I really wanted for what I wanted now. I gave up what I really wanted for what I wanted now. And it didn't satisfy me. And it didn't quench my thirst. And it didn't tame my hunger. Hunger will always come back. It will always return. Esau's birthright was invisible. And he lost perspective and chose something invaluable and visible over something valuable and invisible. In the same way, the enemy shows us the bowls to get us to forfeit our future, purity, our integrity, our hope, our peace, our joy. All of these things are invisible. That's the great challenge of faith, right? Is that we're believing in a bunch of things that we can't see. 
The enemy will always use that to his advantage. He'll always present you with something that you can see now in hopes that you'll trade your birthright for what you can't see. You can't see your birthright. Trade it to me for what you can see. Let me stick something in front of you. You know how true that is of relationships? Man, lifelong relationships built on agape love, man, you can't see that love. You can't fully understand why someone would love you in that way. You can't fully experience all of it. And I can promise you that the enemy's going to dangle something in front of you that you can see. The enemy's going to stick something in front of you that you can touch in hopes that you will exchange your birthright. In hopes that you'll give up on what you really want. I think about this story that we talked about last week. In Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19 says, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Think about that story. We got 10 of them. They're standing in a distance because that was the rules that they had to play by. The lepers weren't allowed to interchange with anyone else. So in a loud voice, they cry out to Jesus. And there's something really interesting to me about this, especially as we talk about growth versus maturity, as we talk about not exchanging our birthright for a bowl. Jesus tells them that they are to go to the priest, and it is only after they respond to Jesus' voice and actually take the step that they're cleansed. He doesn't cleanse them immediately. He gives them an action step that they have to take, and then he cleanses them is what the Scripture says. So they had something in them, some willingness to take a step, some willingness to go in a direction, and all ten of them go, and all ten of them are cleansed, yet only one returns. And we talked about how God is present and how he heals. Man, even bad people, even broken people, even ungrateful people. The healing was the bowl. Only one understood the birthright. Only one returned to Jesus to give him thanks. And look at what Jesus says to him. Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Now in this moment, he's already been cleansed. Jesus isn't talking about being well from the leprosy. Jesus is talking about something much deeper, something much more meaningful, something much richer. He's talking about your faith, your relationship with me. You came back. What do we do after we're healed? What do we do after we experience agape love for the first time? What do we do? Do we let it become a bowl that we take and we move on with our life? Or do we return to Jesus with thanks so that he can say, hey, rise and go because your faith has made you well? You see, all ten had a birthright, a spiritual inheritance, a personal and real and lasting relationship with Jesus that they could engage in. And all ten were so distracted by what they could see, the leprosy. They were all so distracted by what they wanted now, which was to be healed of a disease. That they missed the real opportunity. They missed the real relationship. They missed the real chance. Listen, life goes a thousand miles an hour. I know that as well as anyone in this room, I can promise you. Because I like to go 2,000. But you'll look up in your relationships in your life if you're not careful and you'll say, I missed the opportunity. I got a bowl. I got a bowl. Then we had a great five years. And I traded it all in. Hit my midlife crisis and I had a meltdown. 
moved on with my life. I wanted something else. Man, I've been friends with that guy for 28 years. We played ball together. That was fantastic. It's just a bowl. If you don't return, if you don't keep going, if you don't let your faith grow, if you don't actually mature at some point, you never really experience deep and meaningful relationships. I'm going to summarize for the sake of time. There's a story in the Bible of the prodigal son. Got a dad, two boys. One boy wakes up one day and decides he wants his inheritance immediately. So the dad says, fine, I'll give it to you. So he gives him his inheritance and this boy goes off and he squanders every bit of it to the point that he's living lower than a pig. Scripture tells us. He has less to eat than the pigs eat. He has no shelter, no food, no clothing at this point. His life is in complete disarray. He had a birthright, and he sold it. His birthright was the inheritance that he was going to receive from his father, and he squandered it. He sold every bit of it. This boy decides one day, when everything's down, the chips have fallen, and he says, you know what? I'm going to go back and ask my dad if I can be his servant. Because my dad's servants live a better life than I live. And so he's headed back home, and I can only imagine the angst that he has. I squandered my birthright. I sold it for a bowl. What's dad going to say? Am I going to get a whooping at 35? Is dad really going to care enough about me? Is he going to take me back? What's my brother going to say? Is he going to be like Jacob? Is he going to sell me out? And this boy walks back up. And the story tells us that the dad sees him. And he doesn't turn his back. And he doesn't point his fingers. And he doesn't spit in his face. And he doesn't berate him for squandering his birthright. He does the exact opposite. He kills the fatted calf and he throws a giant party and he embraces his son upon his return. Man, I'm thankful for that story because it's a perfect and beautiful representation of what Jesus does with us. So listen, we all have a birthright, a spiritual inheritance, and an opportunity to spend eternity in heaven. And some of us in this room, if we're being honest, we're not living in that birthright because we sold it for a bowl. We squandered it for something else. We turned our back on Jesus and we're afraid to crawl back and say, would you take me again? Would you give me one more shot, one more chance? Jesus does is love us with agape love. All Jesus does is love us without reciprocation. All Jesus says is, man, just get back. Come back. Be back. Can we talk about love relationships in the church, man? When we're preaching that message, we're going to be amazed at those that come back because they've never heard the story before that says, just come back, it's okay. You messed up, me too. You fouled up, hey, I'm in line with you. If we could just close our eyes and bow our heads across this place. If there's anybody in this room that would say, Man, Jacob, I don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. I feel like I've sold my birthright and I don't have a spiritual inheritance. I don't know that I'm going to heaven one day. But I want to know here and now, if you would just slip your hand up. We won't embarrass you. We just want to pray with you. Man, 
if there's anybody in this room that would say, hey, Jacob, in my relationships, I'm giving things away that I shouldn't be giving away. I'm giving away the promises that God's given me, and I'm chasing something else. I'm chasing a bowl. My emotions have become exaggerated. And I just want to settle in and stop giving away the birthright of peace and of love and of joy in my relationships. If you just slip your hand up, I just want to pray with you real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, Jesus, we love you because you first loved us. And we thank you for everything that you are. God, I ask that we would all mature in our understanding that you have given us a birthright of spiritual inheritance that we get to soak in, that you've given us agape love. And God, I ask that in all of the relationships in this room that we would begin to love with agape love and that we would settle in and stop trading what we really want for what we want now. That we would stop letting our appetite grow to the point that our emotions become exaggerated. That we would become steady knowing who you are and what you're capable of. It's in your precious name we pray and everybody said, Amen. Hey, if y'all would stand to your feet real quick with me. I'm not going to dismiss you yet because y'all need to sing this with him. Can we give it up for this guy? Seriously. <laughs> He's unbelievable. Sing this with him, then I'll dismiss you. Only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Only He can take your heart. Only He can take your heart and make you whole. Make you whole. He'll give you peace. He'll give you peace. You never knew. You never knew. Real love and joy. Real love and joy. In heaven too. In heaven too. Only Jesus can satisfy your soul. That's it. Only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Only He can take your heart. Only He can take your heart and make you whole. He'll give you peace. He'll give you peace. You never knew real love and joy, real love and joy. And heaven to heaven to only Jesus can satisfy your soul. What, he'll give you peace you never knew. He'll give you peace you never knew. Real love and joy, real love and joy. In heaven, heaven to only Jesus. Can satisfy your soul. One day we're going to come in here. I'm just going to let y'all shout out. Just I'm going to let you write on like a thing, and we're going to have a tip jar and everything. And, just, <laughs> and he'll just sing whatever you pull out. Because you, you, you'll be amazed. You, you can't fake him out. I did one time. You one, did? One time. Listen, I want you guys to have an amazing week. Do this this week. Find what your bowl is. Find what you're giving away in exchange for what you really want. If you'll identify that and 
give that to God. You'll be amazed at what he'll do in your relationships. I love you. We'll see you next week. Invite somebody to be with you.